Hey, welcome. Uh, come on in, grab a seat. Plenty of seats in there. You might have to squeeze into the middle. Apparently, you guys all thought this was what's new in Docker, and that's actually down the hall. But thanks for coming in anyway. Um, so one thing I love about DockerCon is that we bring in the engineers, and we bring in the people who write the code and who are the driving this technological revolution that's happening, and, and you get to hear firsthand from the people who are making it happen. And guess what? That's not me. Okay, I'm an evangelist at Docker, and basically what I focus on is operations. So I want to start. How many of you in the room are developers? How many of you are operations people? Thank you. That's great. But like, so you go to DockerCon two years ago, and it would have been like one ops guy in the corner going, I don't know, my developer told me I had to be here. Um, and so we're seeing that more and more, and that's what this session is about. This session is about operations. And, and looking at Docker and how you move it forward. So what's my background? Um, most recently, I was at Puppet Labs, joined Docker about a year ago. Um, before that, spent six years at VMware and six years at Microsoft. In those roles, I was doing evangelism, technical marketing, uh, and product management. Prior to that, at Intel and HP, I was actually an IT architect and IT systems administrator. Um, and at that point, this is where I pause thoughtfully and I look into the audience and I say, and I'm waiting for the people who laugh. I was actually a certified Banyan engineer. <laughs> there were some laughs and there was one, oh my god. <laughs> um, anyway, so that's my background. Um, you can follow me on Twitter, but mostly I tweet about soccer um, and then occasionally about work. My brother. It's tough being a soccer fan. So, why are you sitting here today? You're sitting here today because you read the abstract and you have these questions. And you're like, do I deploy a container? Do I deploy a VM? Is it physical? Is it virtual? Is it virtual? Is it cloud? Is it cloud? Is it physical? Right? And, you, and, and so that's the gist of this presentation is to kind of help you rationalize through that decision tree. But we're going to start, because the abstract says we are, by talking about containers versus VMs. And some of you, this you'll be like, yeah, okay, I get it. And, but the person next to you, maybe not, so I wanna like, kind of level set. Virtual machines are houses. That's the way I think of them. A virtual machine is a fully self-contained uh, entity. It has its own heating, it has its own plumbing. It has a front door, so you can't just walk into it, right? It's got some security built into it. Houses, and I'm not talking about like those micro houses on home and garden TV, I'm talking about real houses are, you know, they're only so small. The first house I ever bought with my wife was 800 square feet. It was two bedrooms, a bathroom, a living room, and a kitchen, right? And that's about as small a house as we could find. Uh, for those who are curious, we paid $33,000 for it. Um, that's how long ago it was. Um, now, uh, you know, th and that was the smallest house we could find. So you contrast that to containers. Containers are, vert are, are apartments and they live in apartment buildings. And apartment buildings share things. They share heating, they share plumbing, they share electrical, they share elevators. Just like containers share the kernel, and they share that on the same machine. They all operate in that same context. But we've got doors that lock, so you can't just walk in. That's the security of the, of the container. That shared model, and the other thing that makes them unique is that I can get you a sweet deal on a 143 square foot studio apartment in San Francisco, and it's only $4,000 a month. Um, but containers be everything from that 140 square foot um, studio apartment with a hot plate and a shared bathroom to a luxurious penthouse suite that's like 5,000 square feet and uh, has seven bedrooms and whatever else you need. That's the thing about the container, right? It, it sort of flexes between those models. The, the deal on that, though, is that when I came to Docker, everything in my life was virtual machines. So how many of you live every day playing with VMs or working with VMs, and that's like, your, how many of you, this is in our, how many of you use the job title vSphere or, or Hyper-V Admin? There's a few of you, yeah. There's like, that was my world, that's where I lived. And so when I came to Docker, I was like, oh, it's just, it's just lightweight virtualization, and it's, so not, it's so completely not. Um, but even though we say that, and a lot of people, yeah, I get that, people think about containers the same way they think about VMs. They say, well, how do I back up a running container? You know, well, you don't, it's stateless. You just kill it and, let, and start a new one. Um, things like that. But just because they're different doesn't mean they're mutually exclusive, right? You've got a couple of very valid examples here. And, and how many of you were in the keynote this morning? I think probably most of you, and that keynote was like fire. 
That last demo had me crying with laughter. Um, but the, uh, the story from the Zenly guys, and this is the second time I've heard this story. I, went, I was at HP Discover a couple weeks ago, and Dropbox told the exact same story about how they were living in the cloud and cost drove them back to the data center, right? So there was this, this migration, this decision about picking the right platform on which to run your application. And up here on the screen, right, these things aren't mutually exclusive, so you wanna go full physical, right? And there are companies that we have a, we have a large financial institution um, who you probably have in your wallet right now that I've been talking to, um, and they're looking to go completely physical. Right? They want to run their workloads on physical hosts. They want to follow that model on the right, where it's an operating system, an engine, and then the, and then the containers. Other people have, you know, they're not ready to make that commitment. They have a number of reasons why, but they're going with the, the model there on the, on, well, I guess it's your right, my left. Um, on my left, your right, where they're using an operating, you're using a hypervisor, right? Hyper-V, Zen, KVM, whatever it is. It doesn't matter. Those, those things are just, they're totally completely valid. The question is, how do you make that decision? And I think that's why most of you are in the room. And so at this point, seven minutes in, you're saying, Mike, just answer the question. Just answer the question. And I will say to you, one does not simply just answer the question. <laughs> and if I did answer the question, I would give you the two-word answer that everybody dislikes. Does anybody know what that two-word answer is? Thank you, my people. This computer, Mike's look, that has already used on a, this network. Well, that's oh, you're not seeing that message. Okay, all right. I just had some weird message pop up on my MacBook telling me that someone was using Mike's MacBook Pro. Which who's Mike and who's got a MacBook Pro in here? There's somebody on this network that's got my, my laptop name. Um, anyway, besides, you won't like the answer. A lot of people are like, it depends. It's a cop-out. It's not a cop-out. It's a legitimate answer. I've had people come up to me, and they'll be like, where should I run my application? Should I run it on the cloud? Should I run it? You know, all that. And I go to them. I say, well, it depends. I don't know anything about your application. I don't know anything about your environment. I don't know anything about your tool set. I don't know anything about the people you have working for you. I don't, have anything about, I don't know anything about your business objectives. I don't know anything about your strategic relationships. I don't know anything about the additional technology stacks you run in your environment, right? So it depends. That picture is from the answer that I give when I'm feeling a little bit flippant and salty. And someone says to me, it actually came from, how many VMs can I run on my server? And rather than saying it depends, I would say, how many plants can I fit in my car? Right, which is another way of saying it depends. I drive a Ford uh, Escape. It's an SUV, but it's a hybrid, so there's that. My wife drives a Honda Fit, right? Well, you would think you could get more plants in my car than hers, but I'm carrying ficus trees and she's moving posies. Right? It's very different. It's completely dependent on all these variables. There's like so many variables. So things to think about, like how important is performance to you? Like what does the, what does the hypervisor introduce in terms of latency? What, what do you need native performance? Are you okay with that? How, what are the security implications? Right? Do you, do you allow commingling? Scalability, how am I gonna scale that out? So one of the very first things, and how many of you this is your, I, I was going to ask this question, so I'm going to back up. How many of you, uh, this is how I define it, one to five. How many of you uh, have heard, okay, I'm going to go from the very top. How many of you are deploying Docker in production today? You have production workloads on Docker today. How many of you have put it in a test, POC, you've, you've containerized, Dockerized your own app, and you've built a Docker file, and it's not in production? Okay. How many of you um, have downloaded Docker and done something equivalent of like hello world or you ran WordPress? And how many of you just have heard about Docker and are here to really just kind of get your feet wet? So it's really kind of, it was pretty much evenly split between those top four, those top, those top four answers. And that, that is where we see um, most of our people coming in now is it used to be, if you went to DockerCon in 2014, everybody was like, deep into it. And now people are just starting those journeys. And now I totally forgot why I asked that question, which is really cool because I'm sure I had a really awesome point to make and now I don't know what it is. 
But just realize, you should just tweet, Mike had the most amazing thought, and he forgot what it was. Um, um, what's that? I should have backed it up. I should have backed it up. I don't, yeah. I didn't store it in a volume, and then I just took my container down. Um, I just did PS Docker RM minus F dollar sign Docker PS dash A dash Q on my swarm cluster and took out my controller, um, which I've done, which I'm so, that's why I'm so happy about 112 about. I don't ever have to worry about deleting my swarm controller. Um, anyway, so, you know, scalability, how do you want to scale? Oh, that's what it was. One of the first things that people come to and they say, um, you know, I'm looking at Docker and they're doing it because they want to move into CI CD and they want to reduce complex build environments and they want to cut down time, right? They want to be able to scale apps out. It's hard to scale out a thousand web container or web services if everyone's in a VM and you have to wait for them all to boot. Um, we talked about existing skill sets. I came from Puppet, you know, people with Chef, there's Ansible, there's people that are awesome with scripting, what all of that is, and then costs. And that might be the top one. Most of the time, um, most of the time when I talk to customers, they say, we really want to look at going to physical. It's because they're, they're concerned about licensing costs for um, you know, certain components in the stack, the hypervisor, for instance. Um, so there's all these variables you have to consider. And I said in the, how many of you actually read the abstract before you came in here? Okay, good, thank you, because what I'm gonna say is, in the abstract, I said there's no answer to the question, there's just a bunch of questions you can ask of yourself, and that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna, we're gonna kinda look at what those, those questions are. And so this is sort of that slide. It's, these are the points to ponder, this is the, the where you start. And, and what you need to look at. So the first is capacity. If, and and some, of, some of you are gonna be like, this is common sense. And I'm like, yeah, probably is, but still give me a five anyway on the evals, I'd appreciate it. Um, the capacity question is, I'm gonna move to physical, and I just bought a giant UCS chassis, and I just spent a million dollars on blades, and I've got all kinds of compute power. Do I have the workloads to fill that up, right? We sold a lot of vSphere, or actually ESX, back in the day, because people were tired of having 30% loaded servers. And I don't want you to go back to that, like, unless it makes sense, right? In some cases, the costs outweigh, or the benefits outweigh the cost. But if you can't fill up a full physical server, then it probably doesn't make sense, right? I mean, it's a very simple thing, but something to consider. The other is mixed workloads. How many of you are, um, so since coming to Docker, I, uh, you know, my background was Windows, came to Docker and Puppet, I, I kind of fell right into the Linux thing, and I'm like, I'm like, oh, everybody uses Linux for everything. It's the greatest thing ever. And then I was at HP World, and I was shocked. Not shocked, I shouldn't have been shocked, but I was shocked by the number of people whose primary um, workloads were Windows. So how many of you are your primary workloads, like over 50% of your workloads Windows? And how many of you over 50% are Linux? So this is a pretty Linux skewed audience. At, at HP Discover, it was almost all, like it was pretty much 50-50. Um, they were very excited about, about uh, you know, the, the upcoming support in Windows. But if you wanna mix those workloads, and even across, even across Linux distributions, I'm gonna run my production environment on Red Hat, I'm gonna run my test and staging on CentOS, for instance, right? Or whatever it might be. Um, if you wanna mix those workloads up, you're not gonna do that in physical, you're gonna do that in, you're going to do that in, in the virtual environment. Anybody here work in financial services, in particular trading? Um, that is a segment of the, of, the, of the business where I found that they will do a lot of really interesting things to make sure they get the right level of performance, latency, um, whatever it may be. Um, and hypervisors introduce latency, and is your application sensitive to that? Like, is, what's your application performance profile? When people come up to me and they say, you know, how should I scale my application in a container? Like, how do I do that? I'm like, well, how do you profile it? What's your application do? What's it, is it CPU bound? Is it storage bound? Is it network bound? And if it's storage bound, is it IOPS or is it capacity? Like, again, you, moving something into a container doesn't fundamentally release you from the responsibility of understanding how your application exists and works in the environment. You still need to do that if you wanna be successful. Um, disaster recovery. So at the end of the day, um, we're doing some really cool stuff. Uh, you know, 111 introduced the idea of Run C and Container D, which sets us up in the future for things like live migration and some really cool things along that path. But still today, um, some of the features in vSphere um, are pretty hard to, to, for people to live without, right? DRS, HA, FT, SRM, all of those things. And, 
and that might be a deciding factor for you, right, today. We talked about licensing costs, um, existing automation frameworks, and we'll talk about this a little bit when we talk about containerizing monoliths, but the idea here is um, you have a set of tools today that work for you. Maybe they can be improved, but at the end of the day, um, we don't want to have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And, and, and that was something that Solomon talked a lot about this morning in his keynote was that tools sh should adapt to the people using them. We shouldn't force you to make compromises based just because you want to go to a container workload. And so this idea of, of um, frameworks and automation, like what problem are you trying to solve? What's the best tool to solve that? And I'm going to come back to that a couple of times in this presentation. Um, again, another feature in hypervisor platforms and virtualization platforms that is really nice that we're not quite there on today is, is around pools and quotas, right? And if that's important to you, if you want to set SLAs around that. And then finally, multi-tenancy. There, there are business units um, and there's organizations who just say, look, I'm not going to, this workload is not going to share a kernel with anybody else. It's just not. And so they're going to run one container in a VM or they'll run a set of containers do the same functionality in a VM, right? And that's a completely valid thing. So it's, it's, it's these questions, and there's more. There's tons more. But the idea here is to give you a way to start thinking about the problems, the, the situation you're in, the scenario you're in, um, to start formulating strategies. This is not something that's going to happen overnight, as you all know, right? Um, it's something that you're going to do iteratively. So the question is, why would you even start? So I have run three marathons in my life. I don't think I'll ever run another one, but every time I get to the starting line, I'm like, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? Actually, every time I go out to do a long training run, I'd be like, why am I doing this? Um, so why do people start? Like, why, why do they even bother, right? Um, part of it's being, you know, being faster, having faster deploy times, being able to set the configuration at build time and just know that it's going to go off and being able to deploy rapidly in that regard. Um, way simplified dependencies, again, from the keynote this morning, and, and if you're a Docker user, you know this, right? Having everything bundled up and having it um, in that container environment really makes it so much easier to roll things out. The unified tool chain, the identical environments, particularly in CICD, when you're talking about massive build farms, all of those things contribute to the decision. But the thing is, you have a reason why you're here. You have a reason why you're looking at Docker. What is it? What is the most important aspect of this technology for you? What is the most important benefit that your business is going to derive from this migration, from this movement? That has to be your sort of laser guiding focus of why you're doing what you're doing and the approaches that you're going to take. So we talk about a couple of different um, couple of different scenarios where um, containers and VMs can exist together, right? And, and um, some of the stuff I've covered, but it bears a bit of repeating, right? There are, in a lot of environments where people, and we'll talk about, um, actually, I don't have a slide on it, but um, I took the slide out. We have uh, Swisscom is a telecommunications company, and they were sort of in the same boat. They were running 400 VMs, and I think it was Mongo, um, 400 Mongo VMs. And they had them one instance per VM, right? Uh, what they ended up doing with that is they deployed 20 virtual machines running Docker and consolidated from 400 VMs to 20 with 20 Mongo instances per VM, slashing their CapEx. Slash, slash, you know, CapEx is easy to measure. OpEx is a little bit harder to measure. But, but gaining benefits across that in the cross reduction, um, uh, it also makes it easier uh, in an easier environment to, to manage, right? Because it, it frees you up and, it, and gives you some flexibility. And, and I have a slide that I'm going to close with, but, um, but I'll talk about it a little bit right now, which is oftentimes you're going to make a technological decision about your application or your deployment that has nothing to do with what's best for the application. You're going to be forced to deploy your application in a way that is suboptimal because there's a restriction maybe in the networking layer or in the storage layer or some, you know, I can't be in the cloud with this component, um, so everything's got to be on-prem, but I'd really love to have the customer-facing part up here and the other part down here. And because you've got this application and the way it's written, you're going to be forced to be, make a suboptimal decision. When you start looking at microservices in particular, you can start 
resolving those or, or leaving the decision about what's best for the application to the developer and what's best for the network to the network engineer and what's best for the storage and the compute to those people, right? An application at the end of the day is network storage and compute. And those three decisions, are, they are going to be tied together, but they shouldn't block you from doing the right thing for your customers and your applications. So migration is, is you know, we, we heard about the guys from Zenly. I think I mentioned this. Um, so is it HP Discover? So Zenly talked about it today in the keynote about how they were like, this isn't gonna work for us. Like, we can't keep paying these outrageous bills. Um, and so we've gotta get things in house. And they did it with Docker containers. Um, and because they did it with Docker containers, it was essentially uh, trivial, right? I mean, I didn't have to do the work, so of course it was trivial for me. Um, but, um, at HP Discover on stage, and, and they did not use containers, repeat, they did not use containers. I just don't want anybody to mischaracterize what I'm saying in the next story. Um, Dropbox told the same story about how they had migrated a bunch of their workloads out of the cloud back into the data center, right? If you feel like that is, an, is a possibility for you, containerization, and even if they're monolithic applications, gives you the ability to make that transition pretty easily. Um, and so I used to like, when I, was, when I was young and idealistic, I can't believe I was gonna say that. When I was old and idealistic and I first came to Docker, I was like, oh, you would never Dockerize a monolith. It should all be microservices, right? And uh, there's obviously benefits to microservices. Um, but there are considerable benefits, and we'll talk about it, about why you would just Dockerize a monolithic application and what that gets you. And one of those things is the portability. So how does it work in practice? So this is a, uh, an example of, of, um, from ING. So what they basically realized, is, or excuse me, ADP, I, ING is next. Um, this is from ADP. What they realized was, you know, as many of you have, if you start looking at your monolithic applications, um, you're going to have a bunch of common services that sort of run between those two environments. Um, and, and, and you're gonna do that in a way that really slows down your development process because they're all gonna be inextricably tied together and customized for that application. So what, they, what ADP did is they went through, and we'll tell the same story with ING, which is basically take that monolithic application and start breaking it apart into common services that you can offer up. And in here, the example is on using universal control plane and trusted registry, but basically deploying inside your environment a set of services, your own CAS, if you will. How many of you have heard that term CAS? So CAS is Container as a Service. And Containers as a Service is basically, you know, we had, we had IaaS, Infrastructure, PaaS, Platform. CAS is sort of the next iteration of that, which is like you're going to set up in your own environment a set of services and tools that your developers um, and operations people can collaborate on. So as an operations person, I'm delivering you a standard set of base images. This is the node application. This is the, uh, this is the node image. This is the Java image. This is the Python image. Here's, here's our Redis image. Here's our whatever. And as a developer, you just throw your code in and you create an authentication service that can be served back out to everybody else in the company. And you can start breaking that down. And that's... Uh, the, the sort of the, the workflow that we talk about when we talk about build, ship, and run, right? Build the software, stage it, and let people put it in production. So with ING, uh, what they did is they have a customer-facing um, website, and they basically rewrote the whole thing in microservices. And, and the problem that they were facing was um, it was taking them nine months to push changes out, right? They just... The app was, and the app wasn't even well received, right? Because they had to make compromises to, to, uh, for any number of different reasons, right? Whether it was the tool, the, the stack or the tool or the processes, all of that was bogging them down. So by moving into sort of a more DevOps mindset, um, they can ship software with, it, with 15 minutes notice. They basically ship uh, 1,500 times a week, right? Just rapidly iterating and moving, uh, moving code through their infrastructure and realizing value. And so that's one way of doing it is to just say, you know what, we're just gonna go microservices, we're gonna, we're gonna take this old app and we're just gonna throw it out and we're just gonna start over. Like it'll be running and then we're gonna, and we're gonna do it from the ground up. The other way to do it, if you're thinking about microservices, is, um, is what Gilt did, right? So Gilt had basically uh, seven monolithic apps that they would run. So Gilt is a, a fashion website here, and their model is they put um, high-end 
uh, sort of, I guess it's closeout sort of fashion on sale every day at 11 a.m. So every day at 11 a.m., it's a huge spike, and then they sell out, and it mellows out. Well, so with them, they basically took those seven apps, they broke them down into um, 400 different microservices, right? And they, they had them running, containerized them, had them running, started pulling out the parts that made sense to them, and kind of deconstructing that monolith. So you start with this giant monolith over here, and you're like, okay, well, you know what? Pull the auth service out. Okay, pull the catalog service out. Okay, pull the credit card processing out, and start building these things out. Um, 100 innovations a day, 100 releases a day, um, and super easy for them to burst out and horizontally scale where they need to scale, right? So there's a lot of reasons to, to look at microservices. Horizontal scalability, much more rapid development cycle times, um, some of the traditional stuff that's, you know, motherhood and apple pie. But as we sort of move into the real world and we start dealing with real workloads, what we call um, sort of monolithic workloads, one of the things that we talk about is um, this idea of, of that, you know, it's a continuum. You don't have to come at this and say, I'm gonna do, I'm, you know, uh, Solomon talked about, you know, not trying to boil the ocean. You can start with a monolithic application, right? There's somewhere in there in between is the right fit for you. Somewhere there, there's an application that you're gonna gain benefits from by throwing that thing up in a container today. And it might be the easiest application, just so you can get your feet wet. But it's somewhere on that continuum. And just because I say monolith, I'm not talking Easter Island necessarily. That was the image I was gonna use, actually was an Easter Island thing versus like maybe a, a troll doll. Um, you've got standalone applications uh, that are small, that, that may make very good candidates to be dockerized. Only you know that, I don't know. But I think that sometimes when we talk about monoliths, people start thinking of like these really gigantic, very complex um, applications. And they may or may not be the right ones. What you need to do is you need to understand where your application is going to cause you problems, right? And there's a list of just a couple of three things that you might want to look at. Static configs, right? Um, if you don't have the ability to sort of configure it at runtime, uh, fixed ports and not being able to handle multiple ports on a host and how are you gonna map that and what's the strategy there, um, multiple processes per, per, uh, per VM. But the, at the end of the day is you can start somewhere and you can end up somewhere else. Um, I think it's Luke Kniss, who is my former CEO at Puppet, has a slogan uh, where he says, move fast and break things, right? And, and I think that sometimes that's what we have to be, we have to be confident enough to do that. And the, the other part when I say start somewhere and end up somewhere else is, that's kind of the beauty of Docker, right? I could start today and I could be like, I'm gonna Dockerize this monolithic application and it's running on vSphere, and that may not be where I wanna end up. I may wanna be, end up somewhere completely different, but having that in a container gives me a degree of flexibility and freedom that I don't otherwise have. The reality is, um, you know, and Solomon talked about this this morning as well, uh, this idea of lock-in, right? Getting yourself into a container gets you unlocked from the platform and it allows you to kind of start a journey. I don't expect that the, you know, and I don't think anybody in this room expects that the very first thing they do with Docker is gonna be the way that thing stays. Although we were having dinner last night with a bunch of, um, folks, uh, some of you here in the audience in the front, and they were telling us, that they were telling stories about the longest running servers they had ever seen. So how, who in the room has had a server running continuously in production for one year? Keep your hands up. Two years, three years, five years, seven, 10, 15. Yeah, you had that 10, that screen thing with the mucks, right? Yeah, he had, he had an IRC thing running for 10 years that he never took down. But he didn't, win the, he didn't win the discussion. The guy that won the discussion was a server that was running for 25 years. They just like, they walked into a closet one day, they're like, what's this thing do? And they're like, oh, I don't know. It's running IPS XPX. We should probably shut it down. Um, and then they told about a, a bug about uh, a network switch that it had a bug with a very specific rev of, rev of the code that if you left it up for more than 180 days and you went to reboot it, it would brick your switch. So maybe you don't wanna reboot those things. Um, just a small bug. Anyway, but the point is, um, you know, with the exception of the 10-year IRC server and, and the 25-year-old whatever it was doing in the closet server, 
I don't expect that what you're going to do today in this first part of your Docker journey is where you're going to end up, but you're going to set yourself up to be able to move down there. And the thing about Docker is that you can change course really rapidly, right? I think cloud is right today. I think physical is right today. I think virtual is right today. Maybe it is, but maybe it's not tomorrow or next week or six months down the road. Things change. Like we, that is the, the whole thing about our, our, the business that we are in. Although it seems like we're still fighting the same problems, right, in a lot of regards. So what's the right tool for the job, right? And, and this goes back to, this is my representation of that conversation I was just having with you about, um, you know, you can make decisions. Today you're being forced into making decisions that are basically like, you know, what's the best compromise that I can make? Like, I would never, I would never um, choose to use a crescent wrench to work on my motorcycle. Like, I would never make that as my first choice. But sometimes, my kids run off with my sockets, and that's what I've got, that's the tool. And it'll get the job done, and it works, but it's not my first choice, right? What you're looking for is a, is a scenario where you're op you have the right tool for the job, and you're making the right decision for the right reason. So if you come out of the session with anything other than knowing that someone had a 25-year run soccer, or 25-year running server, and that I like soccer, is know that, um, that the goal that I think that, that we aspire to is that at Docker is to make sure that the choices you make for your applications and your deployment and the way you put things into operations are, what, are, are ones where the criteria are the, in the best interest of that piece of technology and that, that tech stack um, in the context of everything else you do. So what's next? Right, I got 45 minutes. I wanted to leave about 10 minutes for questions. We're pretty, we're doing pretty good on that. Um, go, just go pick something. Like, just go pick a project. Just do it. Like, just go do it. I don't care what your boss says. Tell him he can call me. I don't care. Um, I'll give you my card. You can give it to him. And get your hands dirty. Like, just break something if you have to. Right? Take that up. You can leave it running in the VM. Just take it and put it in a container and see what happens and see what that does for you. See if you can start solving those problems. But when you do that, you're going to make mistakes, right? Mistakes, mistakes were made. That's my wife's favorite phrase. I'm like, how was your day? Mistakes were made. <laughs> um, and that's like every day, right? Mistakes were made, but how do we learn from that? And more importantly, that last bullet. When you get your hands dirty and when you make those mistakes, give them back to the community. The thing that I love most about the last two and a half years of my career, which is what I've been in, the, what I've, when, since I've been in open source, is the way people give back to the community. So when you make mistakes and when you learn something, write a blog or send a tweet or share it with a colleague or go to a meetup, do a lightning talk. Because the reality is we are all in the early days here. And I wish I could give you some really solid, hardcore guidance on the perf study that I did using EMC storage with a VMware hypervisor and, uh, you know, and this tech stack. But we are all in the early days here. And, and we're, we're going to get better, and, we're gonna, and our operations will become more fluid based on the work that we all do and the way we share that with people. So I would love if next year someone comes up to me at DockerCon and says, oh, I'm doing a talk. And I'm doing a talk because I started a project because I attended your session, and here's what I learned. And then I'm going to share that with everybody. Matter of fact, if you want to do that, and you want to do a webinar with me with, on docker.com, and like, I'll do a webinar with you, and we'll tell your story. Like, come find me, get my business card, and we'll do a webinar, and you can tell your story to, you know, my last webinar literally had four people in it, so that's cool. <laughs> that's actually not true. Like, we did a Docker 101 webinar. Um, the first Docker 101 webinar I did at Docker when I joined just, over a year, uh, just under a year ago, I think I had 250 people registered. I had 1,100 people registered for Docker 101 last week. Um, it's crazy. So if you have a story to tell, if you've learned something, you wanna share it with the community, come find me and I'll help, I'll help give you a voice. With that, um, we do have 10 minutes and 27 seconds for questions. Mark is gonna grab the microphone, and if you have a question, you can raise your hand. Um, if you don't wanna ask your question, I will hang out here as long as people want to ask me questions, and please go visit the hands-on labs. I spent an incredible amount of time along with a very talented team building those things, and we want people to use them. So that's my personal plug for my project here at the show. So with that, Q&A, thank you. Any questions?
We had a question somewhere, anywhere? Uh, over, we got one here in the middle on no, the right. We, we, need, we need multiple people with mics, I think. Yeah, you're going to get a workout. I hope you got your Fitbit on. Or maybe you won't. Hi. Uh, question about, you know, you touched upon the licensing costs for, you know, when we use uh, a lot of commercial software in a container. Uh, can you speak about what that implies? You know, a lot of the commercial licensing is based on the CPU cores, and you know, so when we when we containerize an application and using commercial software, uh, how how would that picture look? Yeah, so I think the question was generally, um, as you start looking at licensing costs and you start moving to containerization, how does that affect your licensing cost for that software? And Again, it's that two-word answer. It, 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 that, those, those costs are decided by the vendor, right? So people ask me, they say, what's Microsoft going to do with Windows containers? How are they going to license that? I'm like, I have no idea. I literally have no idea. I haven't talked to them about it. Um, and so again, I wish I had a better answer for you, but it's going to be dependent on those vendors and how they, how they set up the licensing for their own particular software. Um, yeah. Questions? Anyone? Any more? Yes. yes. So you touched upon an uh, interesting word, which is microlith. Can you elaborate on that? So say it again. Uh, you touched upon a word called microlith. Monolith, I can understand. Oh, microlith? What is microlith? Yeah, microlith. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a microlith is just basically a very small monolith, right? So if you have a, a very small application that sort of does one thing, but it's a standalone application, that's a microlith, right? You're not really rewriting it as a microservice. You're just going to throw it as it exists today into, it's in a VM, you're gonna throw in a container. So a microlith is just, you know, the way we refer to very small applications that maybe, uh, you know, they're not a full-on ERP application, they're doing maybe one or two very small things, like a people finder application in your, in your environment, maybe. Something like that. Other questions? Yes, I'm gonna go this way. Uh, hi. Uh, I have a small question about the way how to design containers. So I've been writing containers for databases and I use shell script as entry points and for some reason I ended up with a very, very long shell script putting a lot of logic, functionality and validation and stuff inside and a colleague of mine faced me and said that's a bad approach. The good idea would be to keep it absolutely simple, maybe just so executable as an entry point. Is there any pattern or any advice you could give, or is there a freedom of choice? So I'm sorry, but it was hard for me to hear you. I should have stopped you before you asked your question. Someone want to repeat the question that maybe you heard it better than me? Uh, sorry. <laughs> OK, one more time. I heard you say, like, complicated shell script. So question easy, to keep it short. Very, very complex, long shell script as an entry point in a container. Right. Is it a bad approach, or is it better to target to keep ideally just an executable as an entry point or a very small, compact shell script? Yeah, I, so the question is, like, what's the right way to write your container? And, and how do you get into the container if you have a complicated shell script? Um, I think you have to look at, like, what that, what, what's being accomplished in that container at that point. Is it, is it doing multiple disparate things, or is, it doing, is that really just one thing? Does it just take that, are you just doing one thing? I don't, again, I can't tell you what the best approach is. I think there's, there's valid approaches all up and down that. I think that, you know, from, our, from my perspective, the, the, the more you can break that out and kind of get those containers into doing one or two simple things, it makes you, you can iterate your code faster, you can deploy faster, you can uh, reduce dependencies. So I would say, you know, unless that, that's the only way you can get it done with that huge cell script, I would break it down and, and try to get it to that, you know, smaller bits. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, I don't know. People, people ask about Docker files and, and how, you know, they're worried about getting these Docker files that are just getting, like, immense, like, hundreds and hundreds of lines and, like, what's the best approach to that? And I think that, um, what time is Gareth speaking today? You told me it was, like, 2.30? 2.50. Yeah, 2.50, um, Gareth Rushgrove from Puppet Labs is coming in to do a talk about, like, Docker files and how do you optimize them and, and what's the future of the Docker file? Because I think your question is sort of even in that line is like how do we start constructing these containers? I think his session will be a good a good one for you to kind of sit through and listen to some of his thoughts on that as well. Hi. 
Hola. Uh, you gave a lot of really great examples of applications that moved really well into containers. I was wondering if you have any good examples of applications that don't work as well in containers and might be better in a VM. Oracle. <laughs> Done. <laughs> no, I mean, I think, you know, I think the, some of the things we put up there, like, if you've got a lot of static coding, if you've got, um, if, like, port contention is going to be problematic for people. Um, uh, I think that if you've got a lot of, um, a lot of interdependencies, could, could potentially be difficult. I think we've made that better. There was things before that I would have shied away from where you've got a lot, you have a, have a lot of stuff stretch around, but with Docker networking getting much better and what we're doing with SwarmKit and 112, I think that kind of gets a little less of a problem. Um, but I think some of those things we listed up there. I think the other thing too is that, um, again, common sense, but sometimes people don't think about it this way. Totally reasonable approach to say, this service is in a container, this service is in a VM, and this is running on my physical service, server, right? And you can mix and match those things. It's not an all or nothing proposition, right? We've got time for... Oh, down here in the front on the right, oh, in yeah. the third row. Hi. Um, Hello. On the security aspect, um, I've heard a lot that the security boundary for containers is weaker compared to VMs, but I'm wondering if you had any advi advice as to how one might assess and quantify the risks on that front? Yeah, that is a, a you know, I don't know. I don't want to seem flippant, but I, I almost push that into FUD in some regards. We've done, um, we just did a really, it, Diego, Diego Monica, who is our security lead, just did a blog post that I would point you to. He did it a couple weeks back. It was like Docker security one year later. Um, most of those articles that were written that you're kind of sort of referring around, those are usually from 2014, 2015. There's been a lot of work done. Things like username spaces to not have to run your container with elevated privileges. Um, a lot of the work done um, with like uh, SE Comp, App Armor, to bring in different security profiles. Um, there's been a, there's just a ton of work done. The other thing I'd say about security is that a lot of people think about this boundary issue. But we've also done a lot of work around security um, in areas like, we talked about the day with 112, like that, that digitally signed node. But there's also these ideas of like, what are my images? Who's providing them to me? Like digitally signed images, stuff that we've done with Docker Content Trust. So security for us at Docker is incredibly, incredibly important. We've done a ton of work on it. Um, I, don't, I don't feel like, I mean, I think that I think, you know, when I worked at VMware six years ago, I got those exact same questions from people. And I think it's one of those things that people, we're gonna have to build people's trust. I don't, the, the, that blog post quoted an article by an independent security analyst, not one that we hired, somebody who wrote a paper on container security. He said, I see no reason not to deploy any workload in a container today. And so I'll just, that's, that's the reference point I'm coming from on that. So we do, I'm sure we have sessions on security. Um, if you uh, take my card, I can introduce you to Diogo and Nathan, and they can, you know, if you have very specific questions, they can get them, get them answered for you. They're much more qualified to answer than I am. We've got time for one more. My favorite soccer team, Portland Timbers and Barcelona. I knew somebody was going to ask. Booing the Portland Timbers, the MLS Cup Portland Timbers? What? Okay, that's it. Oh, I'm in Seattle, yeah. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Let's get one more round of applause for Mike, please. 